This is an ice fish. It's a highly specialised fish that has evolved only in the last five million years with the deep freezing of the South Pole. It survives in seawater kept liquid by salt, balanced on the edge of freezing. Just a single degree colder and it will turn into a block of ice itself. It lives only because of radical adaptions, blood that runs thin and clear, wide blood vessels and an oversized heart, pumping four times the volume of a similar fish. And it thrives where most would die. And yet the ice fish cannot come in from the cold. It can only live in a very narrow temperature band. Above 2 centigrade, 35 Fahrenheit, they would die. And we're going to pick up this cold case to find out why. Most fish are cold-blooded, their body temperature matching the water around them. That's fine in the tropics, but down here in the Antarctic, it's a balmy minus 1.8 centigrade, only about 35 Fahrenheit. Reptiles shut down below 50 Fahrenheit, 10 degrees centigrade. And so these fish are active at temperatures that would kill most cold-blooded animals. Meanwhile, in the same frigid waters, warm-blooded sea mammals like seals and whales use fat, fur and raise metabolism to solve the problem and stay warm. Ice fish? Well, they just embrace the freeze. There are about 40 kinds of ice fish in the snappily named Notothenoids group, which is Greek for strong-backed fish, sturdy, slightly crocodile-looking fish that prowl the seafloor. And indeed, the one we are focusing on here is nicknamed the crocodile ice fish. They've hacked survival in ways no other vertebrate has. Their blood carries antifreeze proteins to stop ice crystals forming, and they've abandoned altogether the oxygen-grabbing haemoglobin, leaving the blood thin and clear. Cold water absorbs oxygen well, but without haemoglobin, that still means they have to move far more blood than normal fish. So they've built oversized hearts and large blood vessels, driving a turbocharged circulation. They're the only vertebrates on Earth to do this without red blood. That's not just unusual. It's evolutionary madness, chucking their life support. And yet it works. But you ask, isn't it cold in the deep anyway? Don't all deep sea fish embrace the cold? Yes, deep water at the equator is cold, around 4 centigrade, 40 Fahrenheit. But deep water at the poles is colder still, sometimes as low as minus 2 centigrade, 28 Fahrenheit. You might say that's a tiny difference, but it's everything. The ice fish's clear blood won't work at even slightly higher temperatures and their specialist antifreeze proteins, costly to make, are unnecessary. In even slightly warmer waters, there is less dissolved oxygen, and without haemoglobin, they will suffocate. At higher temperatures, they'll have to find more food too, to fuel a higher cost of living. They're locked into one of the narrowest thermal zones of any animal. Literally, the fish that cannot come in from the cold. But that's not where our detective story ends. In February 2021, scientists aboard the RV Polar Stern stumbled across something jaw-dropping in the southern Weddell Sea. An ice fish breeding colony stretching across a mind-blowing 240 square kilometres, twice the size of Paris. Every square metre of seabed was dotted with nests. Not a few thousand, but 60 million active nests. Each one carefully guarded by an adult fish, a male, sitting over a clutch of about 1,700 eggs. That's 102 billion eggs in total, give or take, if you do the math. And, by the way, that's something you could never possibly count, because, to be brutally honest, you'd die somewhere around half a billion, although you'd die much earlier of boredom, of course. 
So this area twice the size of Paris off the Filchner Shelf on the northern side of Antarctica is a zoological Atlantis. Or at least the best thing in freezing since Ben and Jerry's fish food. But ice fish are not the only civil engineers in the fish world. In Lake Malawi, male cichlids are master builders. Hundreds of males of some species build sandcastles called bowers, side by side across the lake bed, the size of parking lots. But on coral reefs, other fish crater the seabed too. Giant triggerfish dig shallow depressions in sand or rubble, where females lay eggs and males guard them fiercely. And Japanese pufferfish sculpt intricate circular patterns decorated with shells, geometric crop circles that attract mates. Off Newfoundland in Canada, female lobsters dig craters on the seabed, gathering in huge congregations to spawn. It's actually pretty common, even some species of catfish do it. All these species dig because even shallow bowls keep eggs together and offer protection. Crater walls disrupt currents and reduce the chance that eggs are swept away, and the presence of guarding males deters rivals and predators. And ice fish do this too, but in the most hostile nursery on earth. Their colonies sprawl across the Weddell Sea floor at three to four hundred metres, about a thousand feet down. But they've got to be alert because this is still within the reach of diving seals. Each fish shapes a nest of its own size, about half a metre long, lining it with gravel to raise the eggs slightly and improve oxygen flow. Abandoned craters scattered across the seabed hint at seasonal cycles, or at least nests lost to predation by seals, toothfish and other opportunists. No one has seen the courtship itself, but this is also an arena of males advertising for females, known in the jargon as a lek. And like those Malawi cichlids, breeding likely involves fussy females swimming over males before they choose their final ice prints. Actually, whether they put all their eggs in one basket and stay with one male is unknown, but if they're like those bower-building cichlids in Africa, then they will, hedging their bets with several different fit males, maybe ones nearer the difficult-to-defend centre of the colony. The whole area like Paris real estate, is chosen for prime location. It's near an upwelling, a current that brings nutrients and lifts the temperature by a fraction of a degree. That tiny warmth, combined with oxygen-rich flow, gives the embryos a survival edge. Antarctic ice fish evolved in isolation thanks to the southern circumpolar current around Antarctica. It's a pretty new situation, geologically speaking, that started about 30 million years ago. South America and Australia separated from Antarctica, and the Drake Passage and the Tasman Gateway opened up, allowing the cold current to flow uninterrupted around Antarctica. Opposite to what you might think, this cooling produced a burst of different species, including that mutation that made a clear-blooded ice fish just five million years ago. In the Arctic, fish, like Arctic cod, adapted to the cold too, also using antifreeze proteins that evolved independently. But critically, they still have haemoglobin, red blood, meaning they can survive reduced oxygen and much larger temperature ranges up to 45 Fahrenheit, 7 centigrade. Also, they're helped by their behaviour too, sheltering under the sea ice in the winter and migrating to open waters in the spring when it gets a bit warmer, where they follow the massive plankton blooms triggered by sunlight. As we discussed, the crocodile ice fish lives only in a very narrow temperature band, and as evidence of our warming world continues to mount, so it's worth reopening this cold case. The victim, of course, the ice fish. The crime scene, the Weddell Sea. The weapon, climate change. At the moment, the crime, the extinction of the ice fish, hasn't happened, but it very well might in our lifetimes, because they're so finely tuned to cold water that they're hugely sensitive to even the slightest climate change.
Here's how the murder works. If the ocean warms by even a single degree, the ice fish suddenly needs about 8% more energy, it's been calculated, just to keep going. It's a cost of living crisis and, with another cruel twist, warmer water holds less oxygen. As we've seen, their blood is clear, no haemoglobin, and they rely entirely on oxygen dissolved in plasma. So, when the sea warms, they're hit with that double whammy. More energy needed, less oxygen available. It's a trap worthy of that great spy writer, John le Carré himself. The evidence? Bottom waters in the Weddell Sea are already showing signs of warming. And the witnesses? Those 60 million nests sitting right where the heat is arriving. It's an unresolved, truly cold case, and no one has been charged or convicted. Maybe one day, without further investigation, we'll have to explain to future generations exactly how the ice fish died, unless we can hopefully reach another verdict. Le Carre's spy came in from the cold and met betrayal. The ice fish comes in from the cold and meets extinction. This is the ice fish, the fish that mustn't come in from the cold, perhaps the most sensitive of all indicators of temperature in the natural world. Like frost on a window pane, the ice fish could vanish at the faintest touch of heat. <laughs>